My guest on design today is another local fan favorite, Grady Kelly. Grady is a wealth of knowledge based on his years of UX experience and his daily habits of studying and learning. Most people will recognize the name Grady Kelly from his participation in the Product Hive Slack group. On this episode, we briefly discuss some of the complexities of enterprise UX versus consumer-based UX, and then completely switch gears and dive into uh, how you can demonstrate your creative mind. One bullet point from this is the habit of always practicing and studying. There are many ways to study, and one of which we cover is a more common form of rabbit hole studying, which can take place due to the accessibility and vastness of knowledge we have available today. This and so much more as we get into episode 52 of Design Today. Grady Kelly, thank you for coming on the Design Today show. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I was telling a couple of my coworkers that I was going home to record a podcast, mm -hmm. and they said, oh, who's coming on the show today? And they said, I said, it's Grady. Mm -hmm. They're like, uh, Grady. I said, Mr. Product Hive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're like, Grady Kelly. Uh -huh. And I said, that's right, Mr. Right. Product Hive. <laughs> that's funny. And so that's how they knew who it was. I said, yeah, Mr. Product Hive himself is going to come join me on the podcast. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hopefully, you don't take offense to that. No, not at all. You're very active in the community. Yep. And I think it's it's been a very beneficial to it. Mm -hmm. um, you are always sharing great insights, great mm -hmm. content, great articles. Right. Uh, I, honestly, I wish I had as, the, the time that you've somehow found to be able to go and do all the research that you're doing. Right. I think it's just, it's one of those things I found is necessary. I mean, uh, if I'm not searching for new things or learning something new, then how, how am I going to get any better? So sure. I, I, I make time. Like I have to. It's a good it. habit to be in. Mm -hmm. I feel like I was in a better habit of that prior to Domo when mm -hmm. I was at a startup where I, I don't want to say it was at a slower pace, but right. I, I had more time to hone my craft. Right. Uh, and anyway, so I just appreciate you sharing all the cool. stuff they do. That's and you've great. been a huge supporter of the podcast. So I really yeah, appreciate yeah. that one as well. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. That's great. Um, so here we are. I, I apologize. This didn't happen a couple months yeah, ago, yeah. like it was intended to happen. Right. Uh, but nonetheless, here we are. We've got a great topic uh, to jump into. But before we get there, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, let the listeners know a little bit more about Grady Kelly. So tell me a little bit about your background in UX, how you got into it and where you're at today. Sure. So I kind of got into this in a very non-conventional way. Um, I actually studied classical guitar in college. Uh -huh. And then I also studied criminal justice. So I guess my career path was, you know, that movie Desperado with Antonio Banderas, where he's got the gun and the guitar. And, that was you. Uh, that was going to be me. And um, <laughs> But I had uh, someone uh, early told me, you should do something with computers. I don't know why I'm telling you that. I just had this feeling. Maybe you should go that direction. And so I thought, okay. And um, so I started doing systems engineer stuff. My father-in-law uh, sold courses that did this MCSE thing. And okay. So I worked at a small B2B ISP in Southern California. We had a lot of customers that needed help with their websites. And because uh, we did co-location and hosting and email, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, I could learn this HTML stuff. And that was back when it was front page, you know, or notepad. And and uh, so some of it was horrible. If you did anything in front page, it was horrible. But notepad, you know, I could easily just go tweak stuff and yeah. make these changes. I thought this was really cool. You know, I'm this I have a creative background and you know, with the guitar, I like creating things. And yeah. so I thought this is cool. And so I started making my own stuff and I'd have ideas for things. And eventually uh, we moved up to Las Vegas from Southern California. And I worked at a company there where they decided to replace this uh, systems engineering team with software. And I thought, man, I better find somewhere to go because I, I might get canned. And the product team was near me. And so I kind of just scooted over there and um, because I could do, you know, fireworks and Dreamweaver back then, um, they said, oh, this is great. We need someone else on the team. And so I just kind of self-taught myself from there and uh, picked up on things as we went. Like I didn't know all, all the things we call now user experience design did, yep. weren't associated with the right. web at the time. It was right. physical objects. And so I remember reading articles about, you know, Palm Pilot, for instance, would make wooden, because you couldn't 3D print back then, wooden versions of the Palm Pilots. And they carry them in their hands and their pockets and make new ones or shave them down, I guess, and and do user testing. I thought, oh, that's really interesting. You know, they're making it before they really make it. Like, I wonder how we could do that. And interesting. So this particular company I was at, we had a video email app. And I thought, I wonder if we could make that and test it before 
we make this thing, you know? So I knew HTML and so we coded this thing up and we were able to test it with people and get feedback before we passed on to the engineering team. And I didn't know that that was a thing. It was just something that made sense to do. Yeah. So I just kept on that trajectory of, you know, figuring things out and, and making stuff on my own and trying to see what worked best. And about 15 years or so ago, uh, ended up here in Utah and I worked at Remedy MD, which isn't around anymore. And uh, it was the first place where I was working on real enterprise level applications. And that's kind of where I've stayed. Cool. Um, I haven't done a lot of marketing stuff or, you know, regular old websites. Not that you can't UX those things, but they definitely need them. They do. <laughs> but I kind of keep my wheelhouse in, in enterprise and mainly because I like the problems. Like, yeah. Uh, and so here in the Salt Lake Valley, I've, I've worked everywhere from in contact and work front and ghostry that was uh, headquartered in New York city, but they had offices here. Cool. Um, and then I've been able to freelance for a lot of different places uh, to uh, ancestry or um, in think Arbiter sports. There's a number of different places. I, I worked oh, cool. in vision for a short time. Um, so yeah, you, like, you hit the gamut of work experience. Yeah, I've tried. Well, like, um, I know we're going to talk about this later, but it's something that not, I'm not saying job hopping is the thing to do, but just getting more and more experience, yeah. I think is, uh, is really the way what to was it about enterprise that really caught your attention or that you really enjoy? Um, so I think for me, it was, I, I really like solving problems for people that are just drudging their work. Yeah. You know, uh, I worked at Medicity for a while. Uh, they, a medical company, we had customers that, um, you would lab core was their customer. They made their app and I was asked to tackle a problem of entering a lab because they were doing this thing every day, mm -hmm. I mean, possibly hundreds of times a day. Mm -hmm. And it was like on average 15 to 20 minutes to do this. And like, Oh, that's painful. You yeah. Know? And I spent a couple of days with the lab tech and she was just, she had all sorts of nightmares to tell me about how this whole thing worked. And, and how it was horrible. And she dreaded coming to work to even do it because she knew that there were always going to be all these problems. You know, if she did this one thing wrong, this would happen wrong. If she did this, this would happen wrong. And, and then to overcome them, it was like her brain was filled more with how to overcome the UI to get her job done yeah. instead of just getting her job done. Yeah. And so I remember um, and the worst part of this was at the end of putting this lab, when you hit submit, you got a JavaScript alert box that told you what the errors were. She had to print the screen print the errors on a paper and then go back and redo them. And she's like, great. I have stacks of papers here uh -huh. from like the week's worth of labs. I'm like, this is horrible. So we went and built, yeah. you know, um, a prototype of how this could work and do things like real time validation of numbers. You know, some of them were like a Medicaid and a Medicare number. And sometimes they'd fat finger it. One's I think one was 12 digits and one was 13 digits. And so in real time we could, we could tell you that, Oh, this is wrong. So you could change it in the moment instead yeah. of, you know, after four or five screens in, cause it's really lengthy. So we took these, this five screen process and made it into a two screen process she was so happy. Like I could just tell the look on her face when she saw it, like, this is possible. We could do this. And uh, I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know? And she's like, man, this, this would just make my cool. job, my life so cool. much easier. You know? Yeah. And so that's what I really like about enterprise. I, I think the problems are more interesting. And I think probably because the way my brain works, I, I like taking those more complicated problems and, and simplifying them down to something that it could be done easily for someone who does it all the time. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that as well. I My pr background prior to Domo mm -hmm. uh, was always B2C apps. Mm -hmm. And uh, while there were some hairy problems in there, mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't enterprise problems. Yeah. And I did not have enterprise experience under my belt mm -hmm. uh, prior to Domo. Mm -hmm. And it really is a different set of issues. Yeah. You, you just look at things differently. And I don't want to say enterprise as if it's like, the end all be all of UX. Mm -hmm. If you're not an enterprise UX designer, you're not right. UXing. Right. But it just does it does present a different set of complexities. Yeah. And uh yeah, it they're definitely hairier problems. Yeah. And I, the one thing I like too is that it seems like on the consumer side, you could solve a problem a number of different ways. Yeah. And with enterprise, I think there's there's a it's probably this wide and there's some blurry on the side and you get closer and closer. And I think I like the idea of be able to whittle this down until we find the right answer uh -huh. to the problem. And you almost get a high off it. You're like, oh, this is it. When you find yeah. out and you're testing and people are like, oh, and they totally get it. You're like, 
Yeah. It also makes testing really different as well, mm -hmm. you know, because the traditional like boot camp methodology of testing mm -hmm. is a little bit skewed once you get into enterprise, just because mm -hmm. you can't walk into the Starbucks and say, yeah. hey, you go ahead and use this. Yeah. That's you know, that's part of the problem with our Domo product is mm -hmm. that our product caters to a very specific job title and skill set. Right. And that's not something that everybody has. No. Uh, so usability testing definitely comes into play, but it's testing in a way with an audience who's already familiar right. enough with it. Like I can't even be a good usability test candidate right? because I don't do this type right. of work. So right. it, it does make for interesting, interesting issues. Yeah. We're not here to talk about enterprise UX. No. Uh, we are here to talk uh, maybe a step or two back from getting into your enterprise mm -hmm. UX gig and really just what it looks like to get after it. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I have had some discussions on uh, the UX field as mm -hmm. it sits right now with so many talented individuals who are trying to get more experience under their belt. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, I've done a couple of rants on these things. You've mm -hmm. always responded really positively. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some dialogue on those, but mm -hmm. that's ultimately what we're talking about today is uh, I guess kind of what getting after it looks mm -hmm. like. So go ahead and share with me a little bit of thoughts of where you want to start here. Yeah. So I think it comes down to finding the interesting problems and, and wanting to solve them. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you really want it, you'll, you'll keep hacking at it until, until you get it figured out. Um, I like to tell the story that I, I didn't know I was a UX designer, but I was doing UX designer things. Mm -hmm. Even when I was younger, I worked at this newspaper in Athens, Georgia, where I managed newspaper carriers and, uh, which doesn't sound very UXy, but, um, but this was back 1995. And so these guys had routes three, four, 500 people. Sure. And, uh, this is up in North. East Georgia for people who don't know where Athens is. And uh, these guys would come in from out in the woods, you know, a couple times a week to update their routes. We didn't mm -hmm. have email. We couldn't mm -hmm. send them the new list. You know, they had to come in and they were writing it down because people would cancel and people would be added and they had to add it to their list. They had the crib sheet with notes and just everything. Cause yep. if they were sick or someone else had to run the route, they had to have it detailed enough for them. Yep. And there was a couple guys that were really honorary about it. They'd come in all upset. And uh, I thought, man, I, I hate it. This guy comes in. He's so mad. You know, what can I do to fix him? So I went to Best Buy and I bought this little 12 inch laptop and a little printer. And I had this idea to do it with flip cards. Like what if I got a, you know, a clipboard with the big hooks and, you know, printed out cards with all this data. They could draw a little map, you know, go go up half a mile, turn left, put the paper in the red box next to the cow, mm -hmm. you know, something like that and make it really simple. So I picked one of these routes and I did that. I filled it all out in a stack of cards and these hoops and this guy comes in. I could tell already. He didn't want to be there to write down all these changes. I was like, here, Earl, here are your changes. He's like, what's this? And I showed it to him. He just like, this is amazing. He's like, so what do I do when there's changes? I was like, dude, just pull this one out, put the new ones in. You don't have to write them all down anymore. He was just blown away. He like, this, this is going to change how I do everything. <laughs> so my boss noticed, he knew when this guy came in, uh -huh. he, he made sure everyone knew he was angry. He's like, Grady, what did you do? And I explained to him, he's like, this is amazing. Like we need to do this everywhere. Yeah. So they hired like 10 people to come do data entry and, and set up a whole database to print cards. And that was the morning paper. So then they did it for the evening paper and it really just changed how they did everything there. Way to go, uh, Grady. And so I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like I, the design, it was really the design of that process really changed how things worked. Sure. And so I found wherever I'm working, that's, those are the problems that really interest me. Sometimes, you know, we'll get, uh, I don't want to call them lame, but begrudging problems to solve. Like, oh, we have to figure out how to make this login page better. Yeah. Or we have to figure out how to get people to click this button. Right. Those aren't as interesting to me. But um, currently I'm working on something where we're having to build an onboarding builder yeah. to, and, and it's going to go through the system and track, you know, different activities and then log them so that uh, certain users can know if they've completed these tasks. And well, that's really interesting, you know, and to help businesses train partners and salespeople on their products and stuff like that. And so it's been cool to work on those types of problems and how we can innovate them to make them better. Because in some cases, no, nobody's doing these things right. at all. So I've always tried to find in my career, even now, I've probably done design for 18 years or so, whether it's personal projects of my own that I want to do or in freelancing, I'll try and find things that are interesting like that and work on them or learn a technology so that I can make something on my own um, to see if I can solve it. Sometimes it's just to see if I could do it. Right. Um, 
I back in the day, uh, I used Dreamweaver. I think it was called Ultra Dev. It would produce PHP code for you. Okay. I remember I bought this book and it told me how to do MySQL and PHP on my Windows machine. And I wanted to make a, um, oh, it was a Rolodex type of app just with contacts. And uh, so I went and did it. It was, I wasn't going to sell it. I wasn't going to, there's no need for anything like that. I just want to know if I could do it. Even though I couldn't code, it wasn't real coding. It was wuzzy wig coding. Yeah. But I wanted to do it. I wanted to see if I could make, you know, this thing work and how I had it in my head and how I wanted to design it. And it gives you kind of a buzz. You get, uh, you know, feeling like you accomplished something. Sure. Sure. So for the designers who are in boot camps or mm -hmm. in school or getting out of school, maybe they're in between jobs or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, we talk about this idea of like they they can show that they're getting after it by taking on more projects right. uh, and just working towards something. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're hitting at right here is um, identifying the problems that are really going to captivate you, right. identifying the problems that uh, you find interesting or entertaining. Is there a principle or a theme behind like how somebody would identify what they find mm -hmm. interesting? Well, I think there's two ways you can go about it. The, the first one, and I've told this to young designers everyone knows what a to-do list is yep everyone knows what an email app is yep. or spotify or itunes right you can go design those things and even do real world testing you show them to people we used to always give the test um of redesign like the tracks app the uta app yep and how would you make this better or how would you help someone know that you know the the train is late or yep. all these different scenarios. And I think you could probably work on those problems forever. Some yeah, of them need a end. lot of work. Right. Um, but you could go to people and ask them for their feedback or, or even someone on the street or in the Starbucks or yep. whatever, and then iterate on those problems and then change it and make another prototype and, and just get used to that idea of, you know, working with a, someone who might be a product manager. Maybe that's your spouse <laughs> and, and, and you're getting feedback from them and you're making something and then showing it to someone else. That's really what we do every day, right? Yep. We, we have stakeholders, we have um, users, we have a product manager or engineers that we're working with. I would just find those types of people, make whatever your thing is, and then just share it with people. What do you see as the end value of doing this for someone? Well, a lot of times people are wanting you to have this experience of making things, yep. right? And I think whether you ship it or not, I mean, I'm sure you've worked on lots of things that never ship. I know I know some great designers that were at places for a long time that didn't ship anything while they were there. Right. And, and some of that's politics and bureaucracy, bureaucracy but, um, but it doesn't matter. You put in the time, right. right? And so I think the more experience you get doing that over and over again, the better you're going to get at it. The better you're going to be at asking questions when you're testing an interface with someone, right. the better you're going to get at figuring out if this is the right thing to even make uh, or to even ask the right questions. I know some designers that are just really great at asking the right questions about something new. Um, there's one designer I've worked with a few times where when he was presented with something new, he would be like, do we need to even make this? Like, why do we make, why do we need this? You mm -hmm. know, and it would baffle people. Like they had to justify even making the thing. Sure. And so I think it's good to get that type of feedback from different people so that you're used to it in, in, the, in a real world job. But even just for the sake of taking that feedback and thinking about what you're making in a different way, you might find out that, you know, someone wants something weird in your to-do list app that you'd never thought of before. And I've found over time, a lot of the problems we solve, I mean, whether it's at Domo or, or where I'm at it in partner or wherever, they're very similar. A lot of the yeah. problems are very similar. Yep. We're just approaching it from a different vantage or niche, whether it's telecommunications or BI or or sales or whatever it could be. Yep. And so I think it's good to do those things because you can create some sort of a foundation that once you do get started in a real position, or if you decide to freelance for somebody and you're working hand in hand with someone, you're going to get skills that are that are going to help you. So we're talking about practice. Mm -hmm. right yeah, absolutely we're talking about practice absolutely. alan iverson we're talking about practice yeah, uh -huh. Uh -huh. that's what we're talking about um practicing honing in your craft mm -hmm. getting better what do you see the value in the documentation portion of it then because sure you can practice but right. you're a hiring manager you bring right. people on board a team what value do you see in somebody who is practicing and how do you know they're practicing so so i might have a different perspective on this because i know there's a lot of hiring managers that like to see the long form 
you know, medium article that, uh-huh. that details all the process. I like where this is going. Um, I don't like those at all. There it is. <laughs> um, I just think that's a waste of time. I know a lot of hiring managers also don't, they just want a one page resume, right? I think that's fine. I can understand not wanting to flip through thousands of those, but um, I just want to see how creative a mind someone has. And I want to see if they can talk about it without sounding like a book. Yep. You know, if they can talk about how they worked on something and give me real world examples of how they dealt with a person, yep. I don't want to hear about this is how you deal with people like this. I want to hear about the time, you know, you and George talked about this UI yeah. and you got in a fight, but you explained that. You know, <laughs> you know it's funny. So I just, I, I do want to pause that thought for a second, just because I do want to point out the fact that the more of these conversations I've mm-hmm. had, the more I found that hiring managers mm-hmm. feel the exact same yeah. way. And it's funny because what do we see all the time? We see medium articles. Mm -hmm. We see these case studies. And in the last round of interviewing that we did, Mm -hmm. we would pull these things up, but it was scroll, 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 scroll. Oh, okay, looks interesting. Now talk me through it. Right, right. You know, I just, I had an interview not too long ago with Jeff Carter and he said Mm -hmm. the exact same thing. It's just, I I don't care to look at medium article after medium and in case I have a case study, like tell me about the case study. Right. Yeah, I would rather hear someone say, this was this problem that we had, and these are the few ways we came across doing it, and then look at it. Yep. Here's what we produced. Yep. I, I've inter- when I interview at other places, I tend to, I've noticed that people really like hearing that you ship. Yep. You know, if you're, if you're producing things that can be created, that you've created, you've solved it with design, and now a developer can go build mm-hmm. it, um, they love hearing that. Yep. You know? I know that sometimes we want to do more of the UXy things, yep. you know, and do lots of research or, you know, get tons of people to come in the office and, and do testing. Those things are great. And I think in some organizations, maybe that's totally doable. Yep. But a lot of places it's not. And so you need to find people that can, you know, grunt work it for lack of a better word and yep. go and, and just get her done. Yep. You know, whether it's through guerrilla user testing, they used to call it that, right? Or you can just churn out prototypes and get it in front of the right people so we can get some feedback. Because sometimes you don't have four months. You know, sometimes you have a few weeks. So what I want to make sure didn't get misconstrued in that mm-hmm. is I'm not saying, and I don't think you're saying, right. stop documenting your process. Right. Right. If you don't document your process, how do you remember the process right. that you went through? Right. So document your process so that you can articulate mm-hmm. your process. Right. doesn't necessarily mean write a Medium article, write a, right. case, a LinkedIn article or a case study, whatever it may be. Right. But document it so that you can tell the story later. Right. Right. I think it's important to, I don't know if you'd call it journaling or, mm-hmm. or what you'd call it, but I think writing that stuff down and remembering and thinking about and reflecting on the mistakes you made yes, or even the wins that you yep. had is really important. And I think that can give you, um, you know, some sort of boost when you're in the interview because you can, you get asked that all the time, right? Tell me about a failure you had and how you overcame that, you know, or tell me about a problem that you had and how you beat that, you know, with design or what you did to overcome it. If you have those fresh in your mind, uh, I think that's really helpful. Yep. No, I appreciate you sharing that, that, that light on how you look at these case studies and how you look at that documentation. Um, how does someone showcase to you Mm -hmm. without getting in front of you Mm -hmm. that they have been practicing Mm. without getting to have the one-on-one time with you? Right. How does show me if I don't have the one-on-one time with them? Well, what are signs that you pick up on? What are, what are the cues that you pick on, up on that would demonstrate that somebody's practicing? Right. Well, I've, I've talked to a lot of people in interviews where sometimes we don't get to the show me your portfolio phase. Okay. Um, we were talking about one of these people earlier where I just knew from talking with her that she knew what she was talking about. She was excited even about talking mm-hmm. about the work. And I remember she was talking about a particular app they were doing and how they were struggling because the executives at this one place were just like, oh, this isn't that big a deal. But no, we, we really want to make this better. And mm-hmm. you could just really feel the the desire she had to and the passion she had for good design. Yep. And I thought, well, that's someone we want, you know, that despite getting you know pushed against for doing the right thing is going to want to do the right thing. I don't know if that's a sign of practice as much as it is passion. But I think I kind of feel like they tie into each other, though. I mean, like, I think your practice is now going to like ooze out into other right. aspects right. of how you can present yourself and how you can engage in conversation sure. around it. Maybe it's like uh, people that like to work out at the gym a lot. Uh-huh. Right? This seems to be in everything they do in CrossFit. Or exactly. Stuff like that. Or I know a lot of guys that love kettlebells and they have <laughs> kettlebell shirts, right? <laughs> necklaces. 
Uh, maybe that's the deal. Like they're more outward about it. Yeah. And maybe uh, more designers need to wear Helvetica t-shirts or <laughs> <I> <laughs> that's exactly know. it. So if you go to an interview and Grady's there, make sure uh-huh. you're wearing your Helvetica sure. t-shirt. No, I think that's great. What else do you think a designer should do uh, mm-hmm. if they're identifying problems that are that they're passionate about, mm-hmm. if they're identifying what's out in the world, mm-hmm. they're starting to tackle these things. Is it just anything? Or is there one project that holds more clout than others? Right. Um, should they be coming up with fictitious things? Or what do you I'm think sure. about finding real work? I mean, what is what is your thoughts there? Well, I think you can be, I think if you're really passionate about it, that you should focus on that because you're probably going to do it really well. I remember when I was early playing the guitar, there was a couple of songs I really wanted to learn. And I remember when I found the guitar magazine that had the tablature, the music in there to learn it, I, I picked it up really quickly because mm-hmm. I really wanted to learn the song. Yeah. Um, and when I was studying classical guitar in college, there were some songs that were just, I was begrudgingly learning because I'm like, oh, this is so tough and I got to do this with my hand. And and I, I wanted to do it, but it just wasn't as fun because I wasn't sure. as interested. So I think if you're interested in a certain type of project, like maybe you really hate Gmail. And you, I know there's thousands of Gmail redesigns on Behance and the Dribble, but I think you, if you're excited about it, go go remake it. Maybe you have ideas that no one's ever had before about yeah. that thing. I think if you're interested in, um, maybe you're interested in animation or maybe you're interested in, you know, micro interactions or whatever the buzz thing is that's going on in our field then go work on that thing. I, I think that's good because I think your your desire to want to do it will help push you a little bit further along. But I also think you should do things that make you uncomfortable. Mm. Um, I recently wanted to, well, I still do, I want to learn how to use ProtoPie. Mm-hmm. I've, I've seen a lot of good demos of it. It seems to make really good prototypes. That'd be cool to make something with it. And so I, I thought, okay, I'm going to go buy it first. I'm going to find these um, tutorials on it next. I'm going to go make something, spend time to do it. Even though I'm kind of like, I already do this with Sketch and Envision and Marvel. Yep. Like, I have no need to do it in ProtoPie, but I think just forcing myself to be uncomfortable with yeah. it is important. It's funny if I, if you're right, me interrupting you real quick. Good. I was uh, just today, mm-hmm. I've got a team of designers who, mm-hmm. I, who I work with and uh, they've been working their, their tails off mm-hmm. on getting our design standards mm-hmm. and our uh, patterns and stuff up to date. Mm-hmm. And they've been implementing a lot of really cool tools. They've been using... Obviously, we work inside of Sketch, but they've mm-hmm. been using things like Sketch Runner, and they've been right. using the new Anima app to mm-hmm. build responsive components, that kind of stuff. Right. And I haven't taken the chance to go in and learn it, mm-hmm. and but I knew they were running with it, so I trust it, and they've done they've done done great work in right. it. Uh, but today it was like, ugh, I need to get into right. it, and I need to understand how they're building these things because I haven't used that Anima app yet to build right. these components. And legitimately today, I spent probably two hours building these new components Mm -hmm. and i felt like the intern i was working with one of the designers on our team and i was like okay show me how you're doing that because that makes zero sense to me how are you grouping these things how are you adding the padding how are you uh scaling that and i i felt like the intern yeah and uh but it was it was a healthy uncomfortable uncomfortableness Mm -hmm. but it was nice because my wife said you know how's your day and i go it was fun Mm -hmm. because like that's the the type of stuff that i haven't taken the time to do over the last few years um but it's fun. It's engaging. It's, mm-hmm. it's reinvigorating to like, this is the rhyme reason why I got into this craft right. is these right. problems. So right. now I do think there's value in getting comfortable with discomfort. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We, um, we homeschool our kids and we follow this thing called the Thomas Jefferson education model. Mm-hmm. And one of their premises, uh, one of these phases you go through uh, as a child, as you're teaching your children is called uh, finding a love of learning. Yeah. And sometimes the kids don't want to do it. Right? Yeah. And I remember my oldest, who's now, uh, she's majoring in English. Yep. When she would have to write essays, it wasn't like when we were in high school, man, we had to write a couple of pages. Yeah. It was just, if you can do a sentence, just write a sentence. And she would do it. She would just write her sentence and she'd show it to my wife and I. And we're like, that's all you're doing. You know, <laughs> she's like, that's all I have to say, dad. I just have to do a sentence, you know? And then a year went by in the next class, and I think they were reading Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And, sure. And she had to write something, and I was like, oh, did you finish? What would you write? She shows me this paper. It's like four or five pages long. I was like, what happened? And she goes, I just had a lot to say. Like, I really wanted to articulate this and this and this. How and cool. It was really cool to see. Yeah. Like, even though it was really uncomfortable, she didn't want to write that first sentence or yeah. even that first paragraph. Once she got, you know feeling good about it and had ideas about it. She really blossomed and now she writes all the time and, and you wouldn't have known that that was something that was a hiccup for her ever. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing happens for us in this craft where we might be very timid. Let's say about learning HTML. Sure. I know there's, 
big argument about whether you should do that designers learn to code i can code i think designers should learn to code i think i learned this when i was taking music theory classes in college lawyers take music theory well you would think what are the lawyers have nothing to do with learning music what is that well it's because the logical thinking the way you change chords from different types of chords to to following uh, music types they would learn it we we had two or three pre-law guys in my music theory class i always thought was really weird I think the same is true of coding. Um, I've had numerous times where we would design something and a developer would tell me, well, we can't really do that. Sure. I'm like, okay. And then I'd go and I'd spend a little time on it. I'm like, hey, that thing you said couldn't be done? How about like this? You know? And they're like, oh, you did that? <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's how we'll do it. And it wasn't to you know sure. poke at them. It was, part of it was, I had, we'd taken the time to design something a certain way. We'd shown it to people a certain way. We, we needed it to be delivered that way. And so it helped us to get it across that it can yep. be done, but it stretches you. Yep. Then we won't get into the debate of should designers learn to code. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that will save that one for another oh, day. Right. But one of the things that you're, you're talking about is learning to learn. Mm-hmm. And I love that tie in. I had mm-hmm. that conversation with my son who's in first grade as of right. yesterday. Uh-huh. Uh, and I kid you not, after his first day of kindergarten, I, he came home from school. And after the first week, I was like, you know, so how are you liking kindergarten? Right. He's like, I hate school. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is way too early for you to be right. saying this. Right. And he was like, Dad, it's there's no, there's no point. And I should mention that my son's very intelligent, mm-hmm. very good at math, very good at reading, mm-hmm. very uh, well articulated. I mean, mm-hmm. he's a bright kid. Right. No compliment to myself. His mom taught him everything. And I had a hard time defending yeah. like the public school system. Right. right. And because I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Wait, you got 12 more years of this at right. least in the public school system. Right. And, uh, but that was the one thing that I came back to him on mm-hmm. is, is trying to articulate to my, my kindergarten student that mm-hmm. the most important thing you can do is learn to learn. Right. Because what you may be doing in first, second, third grade mm-hmm. compared to what you're doing in 10th, 11th, and 12th mm-hmm. may not even be applicable when you're in college. Right. It may not be applicable when you're out of college. Right. But what is applicable is whatever you need to know Right. Can you learn it at that point in time? And it stems from this practice. Are you capable of learning? Mm-hmm. Have you learned how to learn? And do you mm-hmm. know now how to, you know, when the rubber meets the road, can you practice implementing these skills? Right. Exactly. Now, we're not debating public school or homeschooling either, but I, I want to help my daughter a little more. I remember when my wife was first starting to homeschool the kids, well, my daughter Eilish was maybe five or six. And I think it was around Columbus Day. And so my wife just picked that topic. And I remember she got some books from the library. And she's five, right? So they're just reading books together and learning things. Sure. And I remember one day coming home and seeing all of a sudden there was this world map on our living room floor. This huge map. I'm like, I thought, what happened to Columbus? You know? And <laughs> she's like, well, the book had a map in it. And then Eilish was really interested in this map. And I started to explain to her what it was. And you see her eyes getting bigger. Like this was super interesting to her. Next thing I know, a few days later, she like has all the countries memorized and their capitals. And and uh, and then she was really interested in what these places were like. We live over here. Well, what's over here? And then she learned about Greece and, and Romans. And then she started learning about Greek gods. And, and then she learned to speak Greek a little bit. I remember my wife got her some apps and she was learning how to speak. And I thought, this is amazing. Well, in the public school system, if you're doing a rigid system, I want to say public school, but in a rigid system, you got to follow these steps. You got to yep. do this the right way or yep. it's no way. Like everyone's on this track. And I think of my kids, I joke all the time that if they were in the public school system, I think they would be told they had like ADHD or something because they can't focus. It's, it's not that they can't focus. It's that their minds are just going nuts and they're really interested in this thing. I think a lot of times we refer to maybe with a negative connotation of like mm-hmm. going down the rabbit hole, mm-hmm. right? And one of the brighter UX designers that I work alongside, and I've worked mm-hmm. with him now for six years, mm-hmm. uh, he is the master of information and knowledge, mm-hmm. but he is a rabbit hole learner, uh-huh. you know? And I will, it, it's not uncommon for him to shoot me a text late at night that he's studying this. And uh-huh. I'm just like, how did you get here, dude? <laughs> right. Like, And he was just like, well, I was reading this and it led me to this. And uh-huh. then I went to this and uh-huh. then to this. And I just think it's a really cool way to learn it. You mm-hmm. know, it, it for certain individuals, that's, that piques their interest. Yeah. But again, the takeaway is learning to learn. Right. And there's so much within the field of user experience that you can learn. Like I know some great designers here in Utah that are super great at just running um, user testing. Yeah. That can talk to people and pull information out of them. Yep. I worked with one guy that worked a whole room of people. We were, we were doing this focus group. He was awesome at it. He wasn't a pixel pusher designer. He probably didn't care about fonts. 
But when we worked together, he would draw something out afterwards and say, like, I think this is kind of what they're wanting after talking to him. I was always amazed at that. It was That's amazing. Cool. Or I knew some guys that were really hardcore about the getting all the data and documenting it. And then he could give you a report and, uh, and tell you all sorts of, he could probably make six months worth of work from all the stuff he could do in a short period of time because of his research. Mm -hmm. I always thought that was really cool. Um, I think you find what that thing is. Maybe, maybe you really like talking to people and you want to do research. Yep. You, you know, you, it's funny how uh, UX designers, what there's so many facets of what we can be involved in and still have that title. And some of us don't have to code. We don't even have to push right. pixels. Maybe right. we just draw on a whiteboard or paper. Um, you know, we can do different things. And I think if you're really interested in one of those things, go go find somewhere that yep. does that and learn yep. that. Or find someone on Product Hive or wherever, someone who does podcasts and talk about those things and ask them, Hey, I, I'm interested in this. You know, what can I? What could I do? And and you can go do it. Um, I think if you really want it, you'll do it. And you'll do it more. Yeah. Uh, I find myself even having done this for a long time. I love doing it so much. Like if I find a if I find someone um, with an app that's interesting or an idea, and they're like, Hey, could you help me with this? I'll totally do it. I got asked uh, the other week about someone's idea. I was not at all excited about. It. I'm like, Look, I'm going to just be really honest. I can't care anything about this. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but this is not interesting to me and I'm not going to give you my full attention on it because I'm not as interested. Yeah, yep. Where I'm working on a project now on the side for some guys where I've been so excited about it that when I've, I've, I have good ideas about it because yep. I'm thinking about it more and I'm noodling on it more. I think when we're talking about the craft portion of it, you're going to do the same thing. If you're learning to code and all of a sudden you're wondering, I wonder how I can make it so if I push this link, it'll make this thing appear. It'll make this happen. Well, you're going to go down the rabbit hole and figure it out, yep. you know, and then now you have it in your wheelhouse and you can pull that out later when you need it. Yep. Um, is it Malcolm Gladwell talks about that 10,000 hours to be in, yep. you know, master of your craft. Um, some of us have probably accumulated more than 10,000 hours doing UX. You look at guys like, like Jared Spool who probably has millions of hours. Right. And, uh, but he's so great at it, you know, and you hear his advice and the things he has to say, and he's still sharing it, right? He That's one of the things he loves to do. 10,000 hours. I like that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing those insights. I think actually it's a great place to wrap. Sure. One of the things that um, I hope that those who are listening can, can get out of this is that Grady's not speaking fluff, you know, like mm -hmm. he he's speaking from experience in this sense. And the evidence is in the fact that what we talked about at the very beginning, mm -hmm. you're constantly looking at new mm -hmm. articles, you're constantly involved mm -hmm. in new projects, you're meeting mm -hmm. with new people, you're taking on contract work on top of your work. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, this is speaking from experience. So for those who are listening, hopefully they, they can pick up on some of those principles and start applying them. Mm -hmm. uh, before we wrap, I want to allow you the opportunity to uh, for those who are interested now in learning more about Grady and reaching out to you, how should they get a hold of you? Sure. So um, I have a website up at gradykelly.com. At least I think it's still there. But you can always find me at Grady Kelly on Twitter. Okay. And then um, I know there's a couple of other Grady Kellys on LinkedIn, but I'm the one that's a UX designer in Utah. Okay. Um, and then on Product Tide, if, if any designers on there, I, there's a lot of people that reach out to me all the time. I, I love, um, you know, I'm totally happy to respond. People are often surprised I respond as quickly as I do, but, um, but I'm totally, you know, you can yeah. email me, tweet me. Um, I'll probably respond. Reach out to Grady. If you got questions, he's going to be happy to help you understand yeah. how you can learn and how you can practice. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Grady. That's Thanks, a wrap. Man. Thanks, man.